tonight I will present you a political science perspective. I know that Christian Jocke, for instance, he also would have presented a political science perspective, um, which might be um, somehow special. So, um, I'd like to introduce a little bit the context of headscarf uh, debates. And since the year 2000s, around 2000s, veiling practices, um, and other practices, of course, of Muslim body um, covering have been heavily disputed in nearly all European countries as a highly visible symbol of religious and of cultural difference. Islamic head and body coverings have been subject not only to heated debates to disputes and claims, but also they have been subjected to several legislation in different countries. So there have been national decisions on how to deal um, with Muslim women's body covering. Originally, this headscarf debate started with the enforcement of a law banning headscarves in Turkey in the 1990s. So this was the first country um, to ban um, the headscarf and this was followed by a law which you all know in 2004 the French law banning as it said conspicuous religious signs in schools especially um, for pupils. Also as already mentioned nine out of 16 German provinces, German Länder in the same year uh, prohibited um, the um, covering um, for teachers, for Muslim teachers in schools. Um, and um, what is interestingly, only in 2014 we had a ruling of the Constitutional Court saying that these prohibition of um, covering in schools is um, unconstitutional with regard to equality. I guess Christian Jocke, he talked about this also. So um, while we had, at the beginning of the new millennium, while we had some banning of um, headscarves, we also had countries where at that time there was a sort of confirmation of more accommodative regulations um, and more accommodation towards religious difference and saying, well, we tolerate uh, the headscarf. At that time, this were the Netherlands, this was the United Kingdom, and it was also Austria. Moreover, we had countries at that time, like for instance Denmark and Greece, they didn't have a general uh, universal regulation, but they said, well, we're dealing with this issue um, case by case, and we don't need a general law, for instance. Um, so we see that these um, regulation, we don't have a common pattern in Europe, how to regulate religious difference and um, Muslim visibility, and interestingly also the regulations toward headscarves differ within one country, and of course they differ, for instance, with respect to the site of regulation, be it private business or be it state institutions, schools or courts, we can find different regulations in one country. Also we find different regulations with respect um, to people, we uh, find regulations, for instance, in Germany, um, a ban for headscarves, um, if the ban is only in, um, in place for teachers, but not for pupils in German Länder, for instance. So um, this is also um, a, a difference within countries. And of course, then, we have differences with regard to types of religious attire in one country, and I'll come later to this, because of course Muslim body covering differs, um, and then we have different regulations for different forms of body covering. And what is most, that's why I call the talk headscarf issue, what was prevailing was the issue um, of the hijab, and the hijab is worn in European countries mainly by women from Turkey, Muslim women from Turkey, um, but also um, from North African and Arab countries. So the hijab covers the hair and um, the shoulders, for instance. But in the Arab world, we know more the niqab, 
um, which covers, this is a veil covering the face, but leaving the eyes open. Um, and also we know from Arab countries, the jilbab, um, which is a long robe covering uh, the whole body, but uh, leaving hands, for instance, uh, visible. Um, and then we have the burqa, which covers the whole face, which covers the whole body, which covers the eyes. Um, and um, this is most common um, in Afghanistan. And we hardly have any women in European countries wearing a burqa. Um, in the real sense of the words, but we have a lot of so-called burqa debates across Europe, which mainly target um, the niqab. So what we can see a variety um, of religious attire, we can see a variety of regulation, but as I said, no common pattern of regulation in European countries. But nevertheless, we have a sort of convergence of public debates since the turn of the century. Um, and this um, <laughs> convergence of debate um, means that um, the politicization of full face covering and of full body covering seems to have superseded the headscarf debate. So the headscarf is not that disputed in European countries as it, were, as it was at the beginning of the new century, but the uh, debates about full body covering uh, moved um, to the fore and we had these debates in nearly, and they were all burqa debates, but as I said before, there are, there are no women or very um, little group of women wearing a burqa, uh, but we have this burqa debate, I think, to allude to the situation of women in Afghanistan. And we had these debates of course, in the Netherlands, in Germany, also in Austria, in Switzerland, and in Italy. And um, as you all might know, in 2011, we have a prohibitive regulations of the full body covering um, in France and in Belgium, especially in the um, French-speaking part of Belgium, banning full body covering in the streets, in um, public spaces. We had, in 2012, a similar regulation in the Netherlands and in parts of Switzerland, also in French-speaking parts of Switzerland. Um, also in Denmark, uh, they are the conservative or the uh, populist party and government um, also enforced such a ban, but they had um, to abandon this prohibitive regulation um, because in 2010, as far as I remember, because it was seen as unconstitutional um, under the Danish constitution. And similarly, in 2013, the Supreme Court in Spain also opposed such a prohibitive uh, law from 2010. So you could see that we have loud debates and we have regulations now on full um, body covering. So in my talk tonight I'm interested in what is at stake in these controversial debates about um, Muslim women covering. Why is this piece of cloth as a, a German colleague called uh, body covering, why is this piece of cloth so heatedly debate across all European countries. And why it seems there to be a necessity to ban religious garments of Muslim women in the public sphere. So these are my question, why? Why did, do these discussions occur? Um, and I like to argue that these politics of veiling and public debates about Muslim women head and body covering are part of a new, we would say, form of a gendered politics of belonging. And with this notion of politics of belonging, I refer to uh, Mira Yuval Davis. She coined this expression and says, there is something going on in European countries which we might call politics of belonging. So I would argue that through headscarf debates, a new concept of belonging, a new concept of citizenship, of political and social and cultural rights is constructed, is 
at least negotiated and promoted. So my overall argument would be that debates about female Muslim head and body covering create an arena in which the fields of belonging and non-belonging is mapped out in a gendered mode. Um, so politics of belonging is a strategy, I would say, with reference to Nuval Davis, is a strategy to separate those in a country who belong from those who might not belong to a national imaginary or to a national community. And these new regimes of belonging, the redefinition of citizenship in policy debates about Muslim body covering, are connected to claims of integration, to claims um, of cohesion and of assimilation. And they are less connected to the notion of recognition of differences and the right to, for instance, religious difference. So I will interpret headscarf policies not only as a form of religious governance, but also and foremost as a new mode of governing people, a new form of neoliberal governmentality to borrow the Foucauldian notion of new forms of governing the population. So I would say that these policies of um, headscarves uh, are part of new governmentality, are part of a new, how again in the Foucauldian sense, a new form of biopolitics that means creating the population, creating the citizenry, and um, creating who should belong to this community of citizens. And of course, these new politics, they combine citizenship with the issue of migration and immigration, of integration, of a politics of religion, and of course, of gender politics. So I will then conclude that the attention which is paid to Muslim body covering in these headscarf debates is a strategy of the production of at least an imaginary of those migrants willing to integrate and to create the other migrant who is not willing to integrate into mainstream society. So to make this argument, um, I will first sketch out the social and political background of these um, policies of headscarves. I will secondly go a little bit into the methodology, how we, um, in, a, in the Veil project, um, how we did our research. And then finally, I will um, show you some of our findings. And um, I will then conclude how gender and citizenship are reconstructed in European headscarf debates. So let me very briefly sketch out um, social and political backgrounds of these debates. So debates about um, female Muslim body covering in Europe are embedded in processes, I would say, of state transformation. And these processes have, I would least say, at least five features of these state transformative um, processes. And the first dimension or the first feature I want to point out is that the European, which I think is more important for the emergence of this debate, are new regulations of access to citizenship in quite a number um, of European countries. For instance, um, Germany um, changed its youth sanguinis, its very restrictive uh, citizenship model, model to a more open citizenship model, but this openness then included other restricted forms and other forms to limit access to um, naturalized to German citizenship, for instance. And also um, former colonial countries, just like France, or the UK with a rather open citizenship um, model. They tightened their citizenship model and also need new discursive strategies to legitimate um, these new um, and much more tightened uh, procedures to become, become a French citizen. 
The third dimension, I would say, is a rising anti-Muslim racism since uh, the attacks in 2001. And we can see this in all European countries, um, that anti-Muslim um, sentiments developed since um, 2001. And of course, this feeds in these heated debates about the visibility of Muslim religion. And another um, important dimension, I would say, is the neoliberal organization, reorganization of states and markets in European countries, um, which have been leading to severe cuts in welfare state provision, which has been leading to the precarization of working conditions, the weakening of the power of unions, for instance, and uh, this led to, one could say, a re-articulation of the former class conflict as an ethnical, as a cultural conflict. So conflicts about distribution are not articulated at class, as class conflicts, as conflicts about social inequality, but as ethnical and religious conflicts. So at the final point I would mention here is that, of course, national contexts are salient to understand headscarf policies in a specific nation state. So we can't say, well, we have this citizenship regime and we have this state religion constellation and then there follows automatically um, a ban of the headscarf or um, a more tolerant headscarf regime. We really have to look carefully at national context and uh, because they built the background for these um, headscarf debates. Um, I just want to mention, maybe we can leave it to a discussion of what your impression is. When I looked at the recent debates about refugees, so since last summer, um, refugees from Arab countries, from Syria, from Northern Africa, and from Afghanistan, um, I think that the debate, the issue about women's body covering is not very prominent in these debates about refugees. And I asked myself, why? Why could that be um, the case? And I was thinking, well, of course, all people um, who like try to accommodate refugees, to welcome refugees, they don't uh, make an issue of religion, so they, they do not mobilize religious difference. Um, and those um, forces who um, oppose the accommodation of um, refugees in European countries, I would say, and this is mainly right-wing parties, they are openly against immigrants and refugees, and they do not need uh, female body covering as a sort of front discourse for closing border, for instance against refugees. And in this debate, what I think is interesting, at least in the German and Austrian context, is more that the Muslim man is in the center of the debate about the refugees, but it's not the covered woman. So I just hope not too much boring you about the methodology, but I think it's, it's important to understand um, what we did um, in the Mention project and um, how I how, how I came to the results I will present later on. So the empirical um, data of my talk mainly draw uh, on findings of the so-called VEIL project. This was a collaborative study funded by the European Union uh, between 2005 and 2008. Um, but we prolonged then the, our search and we introduced also newer debates then afterwards. Um, and of course we had in this project only um, a small, not too small, but not all, we didn't cover all European countries, but we had um, a country selection, a sample of eight European countries, which you see there, Austria, Denmark, France, Greece, Germany, the Netherlands, Turkey, and United Kingdom. And with this um, variety of countries, we hope to include as much differences as we could at that time when we started the project. Um, so the methodology, what we, ha what we did in the project was a so-called um, 
um, comparative frame analysis of policy documents and policy documents of all actors who somehow participated in policy debates, in policy discussions. So these actors were, of course, parties, government, um, government people, these were judges at courts, these were public intellectuals, media intellectuals, Muslim um, groups, women's groups, feminist groups, um, nearly everybody who had somehow a public voice in the debates about um, body covering. Um, and what we did not do, to be clear, we did not um, interview, for instance, covered women, uh, covered Muslim women, but what instead we did, we focused on mainstream policy debates. But nevertheless, we included, of course, Muslim um, women's voices because they were policy actors in the debate. Um, but we were only interested in them as a public political voice, so to say. So, and as I said before, we interpreted the documents, these policy documents, with a method of um, frame analysis. And the notion frame um, is originally um, from Irving Goffman. And um, he means that everything, what we do, what we say, what we practice, is somehow framed in our mind. So we could say frames are a sort of mindset. Um, and they are organized ideas. Um, they give coherence, for instance, to a set of elements. And this is, for instance, a, a, um, a definition by Myra Marx Ferry about what frames are, how they organize our perception of reality, we could say somehow. And what is interesting, these frames, of course, they connect specific policy debates to wider um, universe of discourse in a country, for instance. Um, and what is also interesting, frames construct policy problems. So this is the main methodological issue we had in mind, that um, policy problems, we don't find them out there. They are, have to be constructed as problems and frames are used to construct these problems, but frames at the same time, they also suggest, we would say, policy solutions, saying, well, if we talk about the flood of refugees, to give you an example, then we have a special frame in mind, uh, which comes a sort of natural metaphor, flooding, for instance, a country which is dangerous, for instance, and then, um, this metaphor, this frame of a flood also might suggest uh, a policy solution, namely say, well, you have just to block this flood, you have to create a barrier, uh, and then you might have a policy solution to this constructive problem via frames. So this is only a short example what we mean with a, a frame analysis. And what we found uh, is mainly two distinctive strategy, which is no surprise, of course, and one strategy um, is a more inclusive strategy, meaning um, that um, inclusion means that religious difference is tolerated, is accommodated in a country, and we found this, for instance, in Austria, in Greece, the Netherlands, and in the UK. And on the other hand, we found a more exclusive strategy, um, like in Germany, like in France, like in Denmark, and in, in um, Turkey, saying, well, be careful, we do not want to tolerate um, the headscarf and the visibility of religious difference. And interestingly, those strategy, they combine rather different frames. And sometimes similar frames are used either to argue for a ban of headscarves or they are used to argue for the toleration of Muslim body covering. What we found is um, four major, major strategic framings. You also see here the first frame is a frame of rights of individual rights, mainly uh, the individual rights uh, of freedom of religion. 
The second is a frame which targets state church relation. This is either the state neutrality frame or the secularity, the laicity frame. The third frame is uh, we call the citizenship and integration frame, which is about integration or non-integration. And the last frame, the fourth frame, is the gender equality frame. And I will now go into these different frames to show you how different policy actors use this frame, how they specially um, frame the issue of um, body covering. Um, so, and I think, um, no, I just start with the first frame, and this is the individual rights and the freedom of religion frame. And of course, if we look at inclusive argumentation in headscarf debates, they all conceive individual rights as a central precondition for citizenship. So in our case, this is the individual right to freedom of religion and to wear publicly and to deploy publicly religious symbols as well as to deploy um, religious difference, for instance. So, and this individual right of um, the freedom of religion, of course, includes the right to visibility in the public sphere. And the recognition of cultural or of better of religious difference in this argumentation is, as I said, a precondition for belonging to a Western society, and it is a precondition for the access to rights in these societies. So those actors in our headscarf debates who are um, who frame the wearing of Muslim body covering as the women's right to religious freedom and to visibility, they are accommodative towards religious difference. Um, and they say, well, to become, for instance, part of our society, um, we need special rights. And the rights are the individual rights of each person, independently of his or her religion, independently of his or her uh, nationality. So it is an individual right, and only um, by granting this universal individual right, a person is able to integrate. So that's why I say uh, the right to deploy religious difference is a precondition to become a member of a community. So this is the, the framing of those um, actors who are accommodative towards religious difference. And just let me give some examples who frames the headscarf issue in this way. And this is, for instance, um, in the Austrian debates, of course, we found a lot of very um, strong Muslim women, um, and they use this frame. We also have lawyers um, in these public debates. Um, they voiced, they, they uh, had a loud voice in saying, well, we have to see, we have to grant this individual right of um, religious freedom. And of course, the Austrian Islamic religious communities, they also brought this frame into the debates. Also in France and in the Netherlands, we had these voices claiming um, the individual rights, um, mainly by Muslim women's groups and also by feminist groups. Interestingly, in Germany, for instance, um, where we had this um, headscarf ban, there was one very prominent judge of the German Constitutional Court um, his name is Wolfgang Böckenförde, and he used this frame. So he opposed the ruling of the German Constitutional Court a long time ago, saying, well, we are not so clear. Uh, maybe we might be in favor of a ban. So it was, I guess it was in 2004. But this judge, he opposed, and he clearly said, no, we can't ban the headscarf because we, the German Constitution guarantees the right to religious freedom. And of course he did that with the background of the German um, history and uh, the Holocaust. 
um, and he said, well, we, th there is no line going over this right of, uh, this individual right of religious um, freedom. Um, so, but um, what is also interesting is that some of these actors combine these right, uh, this universal right of religious freedom with the right of, um, of women to decide how they want to live how they want to clothe and so on. So they combine this frame with a frame of uh, female freedom and of women's self-determination. And interestingly, for instance, uh, the Viennese minister of women, she had a rather loud voice in the Austrian debate and she um, in the media, whenever she was asked, she was against um, banning uh, headscarves and she always claimed the women's right to self-determination and to cover um, if uh, she wants. So um, our, ana our analysis shows that this frame is mainly used by policy actors in favor of uh, a tolerant headscarf regime, but only some actors who try to agitate for a headscarf ban use this um, individual right, uh, but they used it in a different way. They said, well, there is also uh, an individual right um, of um, freedom from religion, not only freedom to religion, but also freedom from religion. And this was, for instance, used in the German debates, saying, well, pupils should have the right not to be taught by a covered Muslim teacher, um, because if there would be a Muslim teacher, this then would hurt the individual right of the pupil to be free from thing. Because years before, there was a debate about um, the Christian cross in German schools, which in Lenda, just like Baden-Württemberg or Bavaria, in each schoolroom you had a cross, and there were loud debates before, and then there were, was also uh, some court rulings um, referring to this individual right of freedom from religion and saying, well, the cross has to be um, had to be removed from classrooms. So there was a similar argument. But these were rare, very rare cases, very rare frames, and only some actors used this frame. So now I come to the second frame, which is the frame of state neutrality or secularity. And um, of course, in countries with a tradition of the separation of state and church, which means secularity or laicity in the French world. Um, and this is mainly in our sample, it was mainly France and Turkey, both being secular countries. Um, and in these countries, public institutions like schools or university or courts and parliaments should not deploy or promote religious symbols. In countries, in other countries of our sample, which have more an cooperative state um, church relations so that churches and states cooperate um, in public issues, for instance. And this is, for instance, the case um, in the Netherlands. This is the case for Austria and for Germany. There you could see that we don't have a separation of church and state. Um, and uh, we can see, well, there are somehow overlaps, but the state nevertheless has to be neutral towards all churches. So the state has to treat all churches equally. So this would be the case for Austria and um, for Germany. But in our sample, of course, we can find that those two countries, mainly France and Turkey, um, with uh, a strong tradition of um, secularity, they legitimize a headscarf ban in public institution with this tradition of the separation of state um, and um, churches. Um, and this was also in France, the ruling and the, the argumentation of the so-called Stasi um, Commission, which prepared the headscarf ban, saying, well, this is opposing the secular tradition 
of France. The case of Germany is very interesting and very ambiguous because, as I said, Germany is not a secular state, it's not a secular country. It has a strong cooperation of the state and of churches. Um, and nevertheless, um, some policy actors try to introduce uh, this notion of state-church separation to legitimize a headscarf ban. And these were interestingly social democratic politicians and they tried to push forward a notion of a secular uh, German state. So you could see there's still some fighting and um, as you might now know, now the recent uh, government by Angela Merkel is a Christian democratic government. So um, you can even see that the Christian party in government uh, might oppose a secular state tradition, of course. So, and then there were quite some difficulties, for instance, in the Land Baden-Württemberg, which at that time had also a Christian democratic government. But how could this government then legitimize a headscarf ban for schools? Because logically, the government should then also ban um, Christian crosses, the habit of nuns, for instance, should ban all Christian symbols at schools um, if they would use the secularity frame. And of course, some used the secularity frame even in Baden Württemberg. And then they, I always call it, they needed to use a trick because they said then, well, listen. Um, Muslim um, headscarf is a religious symbol and religious symbols have to be banned from public schools but Christian um, symbols like the cross or like nuns have it are not religious symbol they are part of uh, German cultural tradition they are part of Western tradition they are not religious anymore and that's why they have not to be banned from school so this is a very um, ambivalent uh, argumentation at that time and this is why the German constitutional courts in 2014 yeah 2014 um, ruled this legislation as unconstitutional because it was uh, it treated religion religious religions unequal. Um, but nevertheless, you could see that this notion of state and church separation is a framing which is used to legitimize um, a ban on um, Muslim uh, women's body covering and. Um, what is interesting is that, of course, and this is uh, Joan Scott, um, she wrote a lot about this, about the secularité in France, and she historically showed that, of course, we could say that uh, the separation of state and church is a modern, um, is a, a, a modern um, requirement of democracies, of the rule of law, but Joan Scott, she showed that in France, at least, historically, the separation of state and church always came along with the separation of private and public, of emotion and rationality, and it also feeded into uh, a separation between men and women, and of banning women from the public sphere, and of connotating with women more with the church than with the state, and excluding women from the state. So John Scott reminds of this historical baggage of secularity, of being not gender equal in principle, but that um, gender equality has always to be um, struggled for in history, even if we say, well, maybe secularity is in favor of um, women's equality. So if we come to the, um, the third frame, this is um, integration and non-integration frame. This is a frame which is rather often used um, to make, uh, to show that veiling um, is an issue and a problem of the integration of immigrants into mainstream society and these framing, these integration on integration frame consists um, of two argumentative patterns used 
in the inclusive as well as in the exclusive strategies. On the one hand, um, there is the necessity to tolerate Muslim religious symbols, to facilitate integration into mainstream society, um, and on the other hand, the integration frame is used to um, show the lack of willingness to integrate into mainstream society. So first we can see that actors who are in favor of the wearing of headscarves and who follow a more accommodative and inclusive policies, they use the integration frame um, by saying, uh, well, in order to um, make people integrate into mainstream society, we need to um, accommodate, we need to tolerate religious difference. This is a precondition for integration. Otherwise, if we do, do not tolerate religious difference, then integration will not be successful. This is again the Austrian <coughs> Ministry of Women who made a strong point um, to this argument. So, but on the other hand, um, there is also this um, in, um, inclusion and integration frame um, used um, in another sense and saying uh, that symbols of religious difference, like Muslim um, body covering, is a sign for the unwillingness of Muslim communities to integrate into mainstream society and Muslim women, for instance, self-exclude themselves from um, mainstream societies by um, by covering, and they are symbols of so-called parallel societies, for instance. And we can see, especially in Germany, a sort of discourse coalition, that means diff rather different actors um, who use this frame, and um, we can see that uh, one of the most prominent German feminists, Alice Schwarzer, she used this frame, and she went into a discourse coalition with a rather traditional um, Christian conservative politician at that time, Annette Chavan, and they both said, well, um, covering is against um, integration, and they also um, used this um, frame of unwillingness to integrate um, by com combining it with a notion of Germanness with the idea of a German leading culture. In German it is called Leitkultur, saying those people who don't follow this German Leitkultur, they are not willing to integrate. And of course, Germanness and German Leitkultur means to uncover, to be ready at least to uncover. And this is an argument which we can find uh, developing over the last 10 years. And this is a main um, frame used by right-wing populist parties across Europe. And the Austrian Freedom Party, the FPÖ, uh, was the first party using this frame in its um, election campaigns already in 2004, um, referring um, to this notion that um, Muslim women's body covering threatens the Austrian culture, um, and then this notion was taken up by, um, in France, it was taken up um, by, in Belgium, by the um, Flams Belang, uh, by Gert Wilders, and all other right-wing populist parties. They use this frame that the headscarf is a symbol for the unwillingness to integrate, and it is a challenge to national values and is a t it is a challenge to Western values. We don't know what Western values are, but this um, idea is used in these framings. Um, so, and then of course, this integration or better non-integration um, frame is combined with ideas of national identity and of national belonging. And then we have the con conditionality of belonging to a national community, namely 
belonging to the German community um, needs to refer uh, and to enact German values, but also we found in our debate Jack Straw, the former um, foreign secretary, he put it a similar, in a similar way. He said that body covering is a challenge to British values and to British um, to Britishness, and to become a full British citizen, women need to uncover. So we find this um, everywhere, and here you can see what I mean that. Um, we have a sort of new notion of citizenship which refers um, more or less to um, women's uncovering. So um, the last frame, the gender um, equality frame, and this is the most often used frames in headscarf debates. So the other frames are also rather frequent, but referring to gender equality is the most um, often used frame in this debate. And it is, it is, of course, the most ambivalent frame in these headscarf debates, because it's used by actors who are in favor of a tolerant headscarf regulation, but it is also used by actors who promote a banning. Um, of the head for, um, headscarf. So if we look at the inclusive argumentation, of course, we can see that these actors say, well, covering is a Muslim women's uh, right to religious difference, um, and it would be an act of discriminating these women if the headscarf would be banned, because it's women who wear the headscarf, so banning um, the headscarf would be a discrimination of Muslim women with respect, for instance, to Muslim men. <laughs> However, these voices are rather weak in the headscarf debates, much louder are actors who use the gender equality, in or, uh, equality frame in order to uh, propagate a ban of Muslim body covering. And here, um, of course, actors um, uh, propagating a pro prohibitive regulation, they say that um, veiling the headscarf is a symbol for the oppression and the submission of Muslim women by Muslim men, and therefore headscarves are a symbol for gender inequality. And covering is always perceived as forced covering, as forced wailing. And for instance, Alice Schwarzer, she wrote in an article saying, no woman covers um, voluntarily. It's not the own will of the women to cover. Women are brainwashed, and that's why covering is always um, forced covering. Um, and this is, of course, also an argument which is in the meantime used by right-wing parties. And again, the Austrian Freedom Party was one of the per uh, first parties using um, in its election campaign uh, a slogan I can't really uh, translate now because it's, it's an Austrian or Viennese dialect, but which says, we prefer free women than forced covered women. And of course, free women are Austrian women, and these are uncovered women, and um, saying, on the other hand, that all covered women are unfree. Um, and as I said, again, this is a sort of discourse still uh, coalition between right-wing populist parties and feminists like Alice Schwarzer in Germany. She uses exactly the same framings um, with respect to um, with respect to um, the gender equality. And we also have, of course, um, Muslim women, uh, such as I am Hirsi Ali in the Netherlands or Nechla Kelek in Germany. They are Muslim women, they are uncovered women, and they make this argument and say Islam um, is gender equal, and that's why we have to ban uh, gender unequal, and that's why we have to ban um, the headscarves. So, in these arguments, they pick up a long um, feminist debate 
about multiculturalism versus feminism. I don't know if some of you are familiar with this debate. It's by um, um, Susan Moller Okin. She poses this question a long time ago, is multiculturalism? Um, and all these debates, they somehow jump on these um, long and old feminist um, debates. So uh, you can see that the gender equality frame is a rather ambivalent frame and used um, and used um, these days more and more um, as an exclusive framing as saying well um, there is a difference between modern society and these are western societies with gender equality um, measurements against traditional muslim communities um, which are framed as being patriarchal, as being oppressive um, to women. Um, and I will go uh, in my conclusion more into this framing. So, and I'll just sum up and conclude uh, what we found um, in these four framings. So what we could see is, of course, that head headscarf debates in all of the countries of our sample, and not only in countries with a prohibitive regulation, but also in more accommodative countries, um, these headscarf uh, debates produced at least a chilly climate by categorizing, norming, and disciplining Muslim women. And it's especially because uh, right-wing populist parties um, try to um, capture these arguments of gender equality against um, Muslim um, immigration and nowadays um, also a bit uh, against refugees, but I said before, uh, in this case they do not target Muslim women, but they target the um, Muslim men. So um, what we can see that the headscarf debate is used to construct uh, and imagine national community and is used to draw and reconfigure boundaries of belonging. So the body practice of covering symbolizes and defines who belongs and who is a normal citizen and who is not a normal citizen and who should not belong and who should not have access to rights. So we have exclusive citizenship um, gendered citizenship argumentation which say um, that um, covered Muslim women are signs of non-belonging, of the will to not belong and hence they legitimize this exclusive citizenship strategy. So bodily practices are becoming a norm and the norm how good citizens should behave so that they can get access to rights. And inclusion requires assimilation to norms and practices of the mainstream society in this framing. Furthermore, the responsibility for belonging and for getting rights is given to the individual woman because it's the woman who has to decide either to remain covered or to uncover in order to comply with the norms of mainstream society. Gender difference and the body of women are, we could say, at the interface of this exclusive biopolitical strategy and politics of belonging. And they are at the interface with respect to two dimensions. And um, I will conclude with these two dimensions. The first is the separation of public and private. And the second dimension um, is the relation to uncovering and the notion or the idea to uncover. So when I first go to this new idea of public and private, I think what we found is that these um, headscarf policies redraw boundaries between public and private, not only in secular um, states like France and Turkey, religion should be privatized. But also in the other countries we have a new idea that religion is something that should be 
uh, privatized. That should be the private issue of a person. And this is quite familiar, I would say, to us in more or less secularized societies. But I think with these um, ideas of banning headscarves, of banning body covering from streets, for instance, we have a new mapping of what is public and what is private. So we could see that um, even streets, of course we would say, well, streets are public, but we wouldn't say uh, that streets are, or public spaces, are totally state regulated. Of course we have, um, we have um, red lights and we know how to behave at red lights and so on, and we know how to behave like traffic, but we don't have uh, at least not that many rules which say, well, you have to, um, to wear these and these clothes to be allowed uh, to um, enter the public space of the streets, for instance. So, and with these bands um, of full body covering, you could see that we get a new notion of what is private and what is public, and you could see that special forms of um, body covering have to be privatized and private means they have to be closed in private apartments. So we could see that we have a new negotiation of what is allowed to be publicly deployed and what should be only visible um, in the private sphere. And um, you could see that for some Muslim women um, this ban um, makes it difficult to enter the public sphere because it makes uh, it at least nearly um, impossible for them to enter the public sphere. But there is another notion of renegotiating what is public and private with what we found in our um, research and this is that uh, being public is also being given a voice and being listened to. And what we found in our debate is that covered Muslim women hardly had any public voice in the debates. So they had some, there were in some countries some women speaking for covered Muslim women, but there were no institutions, for instance, where covered women had the right to, um, to make their voice um, hearable in, in these issues. So we think uh, that these um, headscarf debates show that public and private are renegotiated in a new way and at the time when we thought that women might enter at any condition to public space, we now see that not all women are allowed to enter public space, but that they have to uh, fulfill at least some requirements. And br this brings me um, to the second point and this is that bodily practices, that bodily habitual practices of behavior and body t uh, characteristics are constructed as preconditions for belonging. And we know uh, this from history, that the female body was constructed as a body which does not belong to 